In this video, we're going to be talking about conservative vector fields in three-dimensional space. And in this particular problem, we've been asked to determine whether the vector field is conservative, and if it is, to find a function lowercase f such that the vector field capital F is equal to the gradient of our function lowercase f. And we've been given this vector field equation, which is y squared z cubed i plus 2xy z cubed j plus 3xy squared z squared k. So the first thing we need to do is determine whether or not the equation of f here represents the equation of a conservative vector field. We need to say whether or not f is conservative. One way that we can tell whether or not f is conservative is we can calculate the curl of this vector field f, and if the curl is equal to zero, then we know that the vector field is conservative. So when we have a vector field in three-dimensional space, we have a vector field in terms of three variables, x, y, and z, instead of just two variables, calculating curl is an easy and convenient way to determine whether or not the vector field is conservative. So we talked about curl in a different video. We're gonna go ahead and calculate curl of the vector field F. And when we do that, we're gonna use this formula where we have the three by three matrix, and we're just gonna take values out of this vector field equation. So plugging values into our matrix, what we want to say is that the coefficient on i here is equal to a function which we call p, that the coefficient on j is equal to a function that we always call q, and the coefficient on k is going to be a function called r. So we have p, q, and r. And in the third row of our matrix, we always put p, q, and r in order. I like to put those in first because it helps me with the spacing in the rest of my matrix. So I'm going to say y squared z cubed, plugging in p. Then in the second column, 2x y z cubed, plugging in q. And then 3x y squared z squared, plugging in r. That's my bottom row. I need my first and second rows. So the first row is going to be always i, j, and k. And the second row always is going to be the partial derivative with respect to x, the partial derivative with respect to y, and the partial derivative with respect to z. So this will be our formula, and now we just need to calculate the curl of the vector field f. The way that we're going to do that is the same way we'd evaluate any 3 by 3 matrix. We're going to start with i here, so we're going to start with i, and we want to look at everything that's outside of the row and column that contains i. So that's these four values here. These are the four values that are outside i's row and column. And when we do that, when we identify these four, we're going to multiply the upper left hand corner by the lower right hand corner. That's going to give us the partial derivative with respect to y of this function here. So the partial derivative of this function with respect to y is going to be 6. We bring this exponent on the y out in front, multiply 2 by 3. That gives us 6xy to the 2 minus 1, or just y to the first, times z squared. Then we're going to subtract from that the product of the lower left and the upper right. So in other words, the partial derivative with respect to z of this function here. So taking the partial derivative with respect to z, holding x and y constant, we bring this exponent out in front. 2 times 3 is 6. And then we get x, y, z to the 3 minus 1, or z squared. And that's going to be the coefficient on our i term. So we get the coefficient on i. Remember here also that when we deal with a 3 by 3 matrix, we always have this pattern where the sign of the coefficient on our i term is a positive, the coefficient on the j term is going to be a negative sign in front, and the coefficient on the k term is going to have a positive sign in front. So we started with a positive sign here in front, but now we're going to subtract the coefficient on the j term. So the coefficient on j, we're going to get that by looking at everything outside of the row and column that contains j, which is going to be these four values right here. So looking at those four, again, we're going to be multiplying upper left times lower right, so the partial derivative with respect to x of this function here. So we're going to say we have a first degree x variable. That's going to drop away. The rest is going to be left as a coefficient, so just 3y squared z squared. Then we're going to subtract from that the product of the lower left and the upper right. So multiplying these two together, we're going to get the partial derivative with respect to z of this function. So bringing this exponent on the z out in front, we get 3 
y squared z to the 3 minus 1, or just z squared, and we multiply that by j. Now we need the coefficient in front of k, and again, we're looking at everything outside of the row and column that contains k, so that's just these four here. And we know that we're going to have a positive coefficient in front of k right here. We had this positive sign. So we're going to go ahead and say plus, and now the coefficient in front of k. So again, upper left times lower right means taking the partial derivative with respect to x of this function here. We have a first degree x term, so that'll drop away, and we'll just be left with the rest of it, which is 2yz cubed. And then we'll subtract from that the product of the lower left and upper right. So the partial derivative with respect to y of this function here, bringing the exponent on the y out in front, we bring that 2 down, we get 2y to the 2 minus 1, or just 2y to the first, and we have z cubed, and that'll be the coefficient in front of k. Now we need to simplify our right-hand side here, so you can see we have 6xyz squared minus 6xyz squared, that's 0, so we get 0i. Here we have 3y squared z squared minus 3y squared z squared. That's going to be 0, so we get minus 0j. And then 2yz cubed minus 2yz cubed is a 0, so we get plus 0k. And this vector here, 0i minus 0j plus 0k, is what we call the 0 vector, and this is just equal to 0. So we've shown that curl of the vector field f is equal to 0, and that tells us we can say, therefore, f, the vector field f, is conservative. That zero value for the curl tells us that our vector field is in fact conservative. So we were asked to say whether the vector field is conservative. We've shown that it is. And now that we know we have a conservative vector field, we need to find this function f such that the vector field is equal to the gradient of our function f. To find f, we're always going to follow this same process. What we're going to do is take our functions p, q, and r. We're going to say that p is equal to the partial derivative of the function f with respect to x. So I'm going to have f sub x of x, y, z, which is going to be equal to just my function p, so y squared z cubed. I'm going to set q equal to the partial derivative of f with respect to y, and I'll just plug in my function q, which is 2x y z cubed and then r is always going to be equal to the partial derivative of f with respect to z of x y z which is equal to our function r 3x y squared z squared so now i have three partial derivatives of our function f we're always going to generate these based on p q and r i'm looking to use these partial derivatives to get back to the original function f of x y z the way I'm going to do that is always going to be the same process. We're going to start with the partial derivative with respect to x, and we're going to integrate this function with respect to x. So here we have a derivative with respect to x. We're going to be integrating with respect to x. Those two are opposite operations, and they're going to cancel this sub x here. And what we're going to end up with when we take the integral of this with respect to x is just our original function f of x, y z, and that's going to be equal to, here, taking the integral of y squared z squared with respect to x, y and z are both constants, so this is essentially a constant on the right-hand side, which means we're just going to add an x to it, we're going to attach an x to this term here. So we're going to get x, y squared, z cubed, but it's important to remember that we only took the integral with respect to x, and we have a three-variable function here. We have x, y, and z. Taking the integral with respect to x only really addresses the x variable. We have to also address the y and z variable. And the way that we do that is by adding a function, which we'll call a function of g, and we're going to say plus g of y z. This is similar to the concept of adding c, a constant of integration, when we were in single variable calculus and we took an integral and we always said plus c to account for that constant of integration. This is the same kind of concept. We're adding a function in terms of y and z because we have to account for these y and z variables here. We don't know the value of the function g yet. We just know that it has to be in terms of y and z. So we go ahead and add that to our function for f of x, y, z. The problem is now that we have a function for f, but we need to solve for this g of yz. The way that we're going to do that is by taking partial derivatives of this function we just found for f in terms of y and z, and comparing those to the partial derivatives in terms of y and z that we already have over here on the right. 
So the first thing we want to do is take the partial derivative of this with respect to y. So when we do that, we'll get the partial derivative of f with respect to y of x, y, and z, and that's going to be equal to, here we treat x and z as constants, so x, z cubed, they're going to stay. We're going to pull down the exponent on this y variable here, so we're going to bring a 2 out in front, and we're going to get 2xy to the 2 minus 1. 2 minus 1 is 1, we just get y to the first power, so we have y, z cubed. And then to take the partial derivative of g with respect to y, we'll just say that this is going to be the partial derivative of g with respect to y of yz. We don't know the value of this function yet, so we just have to say the partial derivative of g with respect to y. Now what we can do is notice that we have two left-hand sides here that are equal to one another. We have two partial derivatives of f with respect to y. Because the left-hand sides are equal, we know that we can compare the right-hand sides. And when we do that, we notice that we have a 2xyz cubed, 2xyz cubed in both equations. And so if we set these right-hand sides equal to each other, we can see that those two will cancel. What this also tells us is that the partial derivative of g with respect to y is going to be equal to zero, because we're sort of matching up terms from both of these right-hand sides, and we can say that this function over here is plus zero. So we get 2xyz cubed to match on both equations, and that means that the partial derivative of g with respect to y has to equal zero, because there's no corresponding term over here. So in order for these right-hand sides to be equal to one another, this function over here has to be equal to zero. So we'll go ahead and say that zero is equal to g sub y of y z. Now what we want to do, because again we're trying to get back to a value for g of y z, we have a partial derivative with respect to y of g. If we integrate both sides of this with respect to y, our right hand side will just be g of y z, because we had the derivative with respect to y, we integrated with respect to y, those operations cancel, and we get back to g of y z. When we integrate the left hand side over here with respect to y, well, the integral of 0 is just going to be a constant, so we could say a constant k over here. But because we integrated with respect to y, and g is a function in terms of y and z, we've only addressed the y variable over here. We also have to address the z variable in the same way that when we took the integral with respect to x of this equation, we had to add a function in terms of y and z to touch those variables. Same thing down here. We have to touch the z variable as well, address that z variable, which means that over here on the left-hand side, we want to add to this a function in terms of z. So we'll name a third function, which we'll call h, and say h of z plus k. So now we have a value for g of y, z, and we can go ahead and plug that into our function here for f of x, y, z. We'll say that g of y, z is going to be equal to h of z plus k. So we're getting closer because now instead of a function g in terms of two variables y and z, we just have a function h in terms of one variable z. But it's not acceptable to leave this in our final answer, so we also need a value for h of z. The way that we're going to find that value is by taking the partial derivative of our function f of x, y with respect to z. We already took it with respect to y, now we're going to take it with respect to z and compare our result to the partial derivative we already have with respect to z over here. So we'll get f sub z of x, y, z is going to be equal to, holding x and y as constants, this x, y squared acts as a coefficient bringing the 3 exponent here down in front, we get 3xy squared, and then z to the 3 minus 1, or z squared. Taking the derivative of h of z with respect to z is just going to give us h prime of z, because there's only one variable here, we can just say h prime of z, instead of here we had two variables and we had to say the derivative of g of yz with respect to y, it was a partial derivative, so we had g sub y of yz, here there's only one variable, so we can just call it h prime. So we have the derivative, the derivative of k of course is just 0, because k is a constant. So that drops away and now we have our partial derivative with respect to z. So again, noticing that our left hand sides here are equal to each other, that tells us that we can set the right hand sides equal to one another, and we see that we have 3xy squared z squared in both, so we match those up, 
that means that in order for the right hand sides to be equal to one another, h prime of z has to be equal to zero because we can say we have a plus zero over here. Those are the only two things that match. So we'll say zero is equal to h prime of z. Now what we're really looking for here is a value for h of z because we have h of z in our function here for f of x, y. So in order to get back to h of z, we need to go ahead and integrate both sides of this with respect to z because over on the right hand side, we have the derivative with respect to z. When we integrate that with respect to z, those operations cancel and we'll get a function for h of z. Integrating this left hand side over here with respect to z, again, the derivative of zero is just a constant, so we'll call this a constant L, since we already used K to represent a different constant. So the integral of zero is just going to be L, and we don't have to add to this a different function like we added H of Z over here, because this is a single variable function. Over here, when we took the integral of G sub Y of YZ, we took it with respect to Y. So we had to add a function in terms of Z to address the fact that we had a Z variable here. Here, we're just taking the integral with respect to z of both sides. There's no variable that we haven't touched yet. So the integral of zero is just L. We leave it as a constant and we can go ahead and plug in L for h of z. So taking this equation and bringing it down here, we're going to say that f of x, y, z is going to be equal to x, y squared, z cubed. Now we have plus h of z. We know that h of z is L, so we get plus L. And then we have here plus k. Now all we need to realize is that when we have two constants left over here in our final answer, we can actually combine them into a single constant. Because if we ever needed to solve for these constants, we could solve for them separately. Let's say that we solved for both and we said L was 3 and K was 2. Well, we would add them together and get 5. So if we combine these two constants together and we call the single constant K, then when we solve for K, we'll just get K equals 5. So we don't have to keep them separate because they just both represent constants. We can combine them and say that our final answer is F of X, Y, Z is equal to X, Y squared, Z cubed plus K. And this is the function f whose gradient here, the gradient of f, is equal to the vector field, capital F, represented by this equation when we know that f is a conservative vector field.